Hi, I'm Taylor with Mom on the Spectrum, and in today's video, we're going to be talking about five autistic sleep challenges and some remedies that will help you deal with those challenges. I started this channel as a late diagnosed autistic mom of two. I was diagnosed at 31 as autistic. I'm 33 now, and I've had a couple of years to completely rethink my life and rediscover who I am through a completely different lens. I feel more like myself than I ever have, and I'm here with the channel and the community here to help support you as a late diagnosed autistic person. If you haven't already subscribed, go ahead and hit that button and you'll stay up to date with all of the resources that I create for the autistic community. As a reminder, if you're new to the channel, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a therapist, I'm an autistic mom sharing my experiences. If you relate to all five sleep challenges on the list, it doesn't mean you're autistic. This is just a way for the autistic community to connect with one another, and if you're interested in seeking diagnosis, I have other videos that could be helpful for that. Stick around until the end of the video. I'm going to be sharing my absolute number one favorite sleep accessory that I just discovered last year. I sleep with it every single night. I can't wait to share it with you. So before we jump right into our list, just a quick statement that I've realized that a lot of autistic research is starting to show that sleep problems are kind of par for the course, if you will, of being an autistic person. And there's even some research to suggest that it might be worth including sleep challenges in the diagnostic criteria for autism. So I just thought I would throw that out there. It's pretty ubiquitous that people on the spectrum deal with sleep challenges. And that's what we're going to dive into today. So let's jump right in. So the number one most common autistic sleep challenge seems to be difficulty with transitions. Now, if you are new to life on the spectrum, this might blow your mind, but transitional elements of our day are where we can lose a lot of time. So for example, for me sitting in the car, like if I drive to the store, I'm going to sit in the car for a long time before going inside because that transition, it's like trying to find homeostasis between two different, completely different environments. Um, there's so many different reasons why transitions are hard for me. I think that it comes down to nervous system regulation a lot of the time. Cause I think that I need a prolonged period of time in a situation before I actually feel calm and stable. That's the goal, right? But with sleep, there are so many transitions involved. And I got so many comments from y'all saying, I just can't start the bedtime routine. I just can't start the process. And then let's say you finally do get through the process. I just can't get in bed. I just can't get under the covers. There's something about those transitions of going from dinner to getting ready for bed to getting in the bed. And I think that this also has a lot to do with autistic inertia and demand avoidance. Let me explain. The idea of autistic inertia is that if we're doing something, it's really hard to stop doing that thing. And if we aren't doing anything, it's really hard to start doing something. We all have demand avoidance to some degree, autistic or allistic, non-autistic. Like clean your room. No, I don't wanna clean my room. We all have demand avoidance in some capacity, but for autistic people, it can just hit so hard all the time. This can be the demand of having to order something off of a menu or make a decision about what you wanna wear in the morning. Those types of things can all be demands that are placed on us. So the bedtime routine, the bedtime process has all kinds of demands that we must face over and over again. You need to brush your teeth, you need to put your pajamas on, you need to take a shower, whatever it might be, demand, demand, demand. And these things can cause us to avoid the process of getting ready altogether. Here's some examples sent in from the community. My happy account says, my husband has trouble stopping what he's doing to go to bed. Just the other night, he stayed up until 4 a.m. editing a story, even though he had work the next day. It used to drive me nuts, but I've learned to relax about it. As long as he's not cranky with me from lack of sleep or late for work, we're good. Kai Russell says, I'm not sure if this counts, but I struggle with getting myself to go to bed. Even once I've stopped whatever I'm doing, I'll just stand around or wonder about. I'm not sure if I procrastinate because I don't want to go to bed or because I don't want to go through my bedtime routines. I don't like it, but going to bed before midnight is early for me. I got so many comments just like this one where y'all were saying, I don't know why, but I just wander around my house at night or I'm stuck on the couch and I can't get up. And it's just like, I know I'm supposed to go in the bathroom and get ready for bed, but I can't. And then Crystal Johnson says, for me, it's the transition. Going from whatever I'm doing to getting ready for bed has always been a struggle. I have a solid bedtime routine, but getting it started is such a challenge. One of the second most common autistic sleep challenges is dealing with coexisting conditions. So a coexisting condition can be any other type of medical or health condition that causes discomfort, stress, inflammation, etc. 
So for autistic people, this is a very common occurrence that you do have coexisting conditions. It could be ADHD, it could be OCD, it could be CPTSD, which is complex post-traumatic stress disorder. There's all kinds of different conditions that we deal with as people on the spectrum. One thing that came up a lot in your comments is restless leg syndrome. So to me, that kind of reminds me of our nervous system dysregulation and just not being able to quiet all of the energy in our body, not knowing quite how to process everything that happened that day. Along with coexisting conditions, I also want to point out gastrointestinal gastrointestinal issues. So this is almost synonymous with being autistic is having gastrointestinal issues. I said it right that time. Again, going back to our nervous system dysregulation that we deal with a lot more frequently than other people. If our nervous system is dysregulated, it's going to affect our ability to digest food. There's all other things that we can talk about related to this, but there's many people who have said at night, their stomachs are still working through a lot of the food that they had and their stomachs gargling, they're uncomfortable, they have cramps, whatever it might be. Um, those gastrointestinal issues can really make it hard to get some shut eye at the end of the day. Here are some comments that y'all sent in. Bicarious says, I have a pretty hard time shutting down my mind and I feel like I just cannot relax ever. I was diagnosed a while back with restless leg syndrome, and I'm basically just constantly twitching. I also suffer from various chronic illnesses that cause me pain, among other things. So getting physically comfortable is very difficult in that regard. And then this next comment from, we'll call them Violet. I'm going to focus on the second half of this. They said if they have caffeine or a sensory stimulate, I think they mean sensory stimulating food past a certain time in the day. My interoceptive sense is on high alert and I'm distracted by every movement in my tummy. I don't get it when people can sleep anywhere under any conditions I wish. Me too. All right, that brings us to the third point. The third autistic sleep challenge that is common for people on the spectrum is sensory overwhelm. Now, this is a very common, very prevalent issue for people on the spectrum at bedtime and all throughout the day. We are much more prone to be aware of information that's coming in through our senses. So the lights might be too bright. We might not like the particular feel of a certain fabric on our skin. We might have to have all of the noise completely quieted in the house. We're very hyper aware of the information coming in through our senses. And this can really catch up with us whenever we get in bed. So when we're in bed, we're trying to catch up from all of the sensory processing that we're doing throughout the day. We're finally in a quiet spot, but we're still aware of everything around us. The sound of the fan, the body temperature of the person next to us, if we've got a partner with us, the way our clothes are feeling, the light. You might notice like a tiny little crevice of light that's coming in through the window. All of these things make us hyper aware and we'll get fixated on it to the point that we can't concentrate or relax. Along with this comes, probably you're aware of this, needing everything to be just right, which also comes with having your own slew of accoutrements. Is that the right word? Like things that you have to have in order to sleep. So an eye mask, a weighted blanket, having a glass of water on your nightstand, having the fan at the same exact speed every time, whatever it might be. I saw so many suggestions coming in from everybody for the way they need it to be. And that's just kind of part of the autistic sleep experience. You might have to have a fan on your nightstand blowing at your face. Um, for some of you, that might sound like torture, but we all have our special little routines and things that we set up around ourselves to help us get some shut eye. This can also obviously, hopefully obviously, make it difficult for us to sleep with other people. So if it takes that much for us to get situated, another person is going to add so much more into the mix. What are they doing? How are they moving? What is their body temperature like? What are they wearing? What do they smell like? All of these things it can be tremendously difficult to make yourself comfortable in the presence of another person in such like an intimate personal space. All of this sensory overwhelm, again, leads to our nervous system dysregulation where it can feel like one foot is on the gas and one foot is on the brake at the same time. And if you're interested in why that happens, it's it has to do with our parasympathetic and our sympathetic nervous system. One acts like the gas, one acts like the brake. And if they're both on at the same time, it can feel like you are never able to get settled. This comment from, we'll call them Maria, says, I need everything to be just the way I like, and I need to be able to follow the same routine I do every day. 
Also, in times when I'm more anxious, stressed, or overwhelmed, it takes a little longer for me to fall asleep, and it's very hard to take a little nap during the day for me too, which helps me between circles of study because I tend to feel more uncomfortable with possible wrinkles in the bed sheets. There were several comments like this and things like that. The next comment from Mare Mello says, I have to have my blankets and pillows and sleep position perfect to relax. My husband and I adapted early on to have separate blankets because we cannot share. I also am addicted to having the TV on while I fall asleep and it has to be a comfort show. So that's one example where some of us might be saying, oh my gosh, there's no way I could have the TV on to sleep. There's no way I could fall asleep. And some of us are going to say, no, absolutely. I have to have it on. Here's some more comments. Whitney Mason says, I find that I'm hypersensitive to sound even in sleep. So the slightest noise wakes me up. Earplugs or white noise helps a lot. I also notice that once I'm up, I'm up, I'm wide awake and I can't fall back asleep. Nari Pari says that everything has to be just right. I keep adjusting everything so much. The pillow, the bed linen, not even the tiniest crumbs on the bed, air moisturizer on, curtains closed, the list goes on. I have a long bedtime routine and I don't like it when it's interrupted. Christine says, sensory sensitivity means everything must be just so or sleep will not happen. No light in the room whatsoever. Partner can't be breathing too loud. Exactly the right temperature, number of blankets, body position, etc., etc. It really makes traveling difficult. That's a good point. Passaggio Olivello says, I'm hypersensitive to every little sound or movement. That's why I can't sleep with a person or an animal in the same room. I totally get that with an animal. Like my cat sleeps right on my chest and I love it. But a lot of times it keeps me from sleeping because I'm so hyper aware of his movements. And then the fourth autistic sleep challenge that we're talking about today is delayed processing slash trouble turning off your mind. It is so common for us on the spectrum to get in bed and to just finally understand the implications of something that happened to you that day, or maybe the day before, or maybe the week before. Because in the moment, sometimes we'll respond to a situation, and I heard somebody say this in one of the community groups, the first response that they give is not usually their true response. Not that it's a lie. It's just not how they would choose to respond if they fully understood the implications of the conversation. I hope that makes sense. So whenever you step away from the conversation and you have time to process it in the comfort of your own environment and the safety of your own environment, you get a better understanding of the situation and a better idea of what you actually wanted to say and communicate. So that process that I just described that's happening at the end of the day when, when we, when we get in bed and we're laying there and we're thinking, oh gosh, I just, it just now makes sense to me what they were saying to me earlier today. And so you're taking all of that information on this delayed processing and rather than your body winding down to go to sleep, it's ramping up and trying to figure out how you could have better approach situations that have already happened. This obviously plays into having a hard time turning your mind off. So those things together, it can feel like you're just on a hamster wheel and nothing ever stops. PT Love and Light says, I suffer from bedtime procrastination. After having to mask so much during the day and performing the intense tasks of my hospital job, I'm depleted by the end of the day. So at night I recharge and recover, which leaves me feeling energized at bedtime. Dana says, I need a lot of time to process things because I'm usually not able to in the moment. This can be related to masking or having other priorities. My brain likes to replay the day and certain situations over and over. And I usually am anxious about the next day, overthinking and planning. The latter might be more anxiety related, but all of this makes it hard for me to fall asleep or get a deep sleep. Sometimes it's difficult to stop doing something I enjoy. And that really plays back into the autistic inertia that we were talking about earlier in the video. And that brings us to our fifth and final autistic sleep challenge. And that is paradoxical reactions to sleep aids. This might sound weird. This is something that my psychologist was talking to me about. And there's new research that is showing that sometimes autistic people can have paradoxical reactions to medication or supplements. And this has really been a factor in my life. For example, melatonin does not make me sleepy. It actually has the opposite effect. Like when I take it, I'm like awake. I've noticed that with several other things in my life too, where like, hey, this is supposed to make me sleepy, but now I'm like wired. So if that's happened to you, I'd be curious to hear in the comments, like what other things have worked that way for you. But there's some research to suggest that it has to do with serotonin differences in our brain. So I think that's really interesting. But in addition to medication, supplements, that type of thing, 
also activities can make us react paradoxically. So like reading for most people makes them sleepy, but for an autistic person, it might wake you up and get your brain going. And you might want to go into like autistic research mode and just study the heck out of it, whatever you're reading. Um, so reading I've heard from many people is not a bedtime activity. That's like a morning activity when you're fresh and have a lot of energy and you're alert and want to learn. So Just being aware that we can have paradoxical reactions to things, I think can be really helpful as you kind of mindfully navigate your sleep process and figure out the things that are working for you and the things that maybe you could switch up a little bit. So on that note, let's talk about some remedies for some of these sleep challenges. I'm bringing my pillow back. Okay, so again, just to reiterate, these remedies aren't going to cure all of your sleep problems forever, but I do feel like they offer some practical opportunities for changing your habits and better supporting yourself so that you can get better sleep. This is going to depend a lot on how our day goes and how our nervous system is during that particular day, but let's jump into some things that we can actively be doing to help accommodate ourselves in this area. So the first thing for difficulty with transitions, uh, one thing that I learned about in an autistic community group that I was running last semester is body doubling. Okay, this is a totally new concept for me, but body doubling is asking somebody that you're with, if you live with a partner or somebody else, to do what you need to do. So if you're both sitting on the couch, hey, could you come with me and let's go brush our teeth in the bathroom? Maybe that sounds super weird. Hey, can you get up with me and let's go get a drink of water and start getting ready for bed? Anything where you can ask another person to basically double you what you're doing. It can provide some incentive and motivation for carrying out that thing that you know you need to do, but you're just not doing. Also, don't don't underestimate the value of just being able to identify what the problem actually is. So if you're stuck on the couch and you can say to yourself out loud or just in your head, okay, I need to be in the bathroom brushing my teeth. I'm not in the bathroom brushing my teeth this is something that I want to change, right? So just having that mindfulness, you have to be aware of something first before you can change it. So don't underestimate the value of self-awareness. You can also, my cat is here. You can also break the task into smaller tasks. So rather than saying, oh, I need to get ready for bed. Okay, step number one, get off the couch. Step number two, walk to the bathroom. That might sound simplistic, but For me, at least after I do that a couple of times and get the ball rolling, get that inertia going, I can carry out the rest of it without having to do the step-by-step stuff. So at least at the beginning to get the process going. And then I also had several of you say that you utilize technology to help you motivate yourself. So somebody said that they've programmed Alexa to have timers at night where when it's 30 minutes before bedtime, Alexa will come on and say, hey, you have 30 minutes until you have to get ready for bed. And then 30 minutes later, it'll come back on and say, hey, you have to get up right now. You know you need to, you know you'll be so grateful, just get up and do it. So apparently you can program things to do that kind of thing. And technology can be a really helpful source of support and motivating yourself to do things. To each their own, right? I mean, that's gonna work for some people and some people will have to explore other options. Like, for example, to help with gastrointestinal issues, make sure that you're drinking plenty of water throughout the day. A good goal to aim for is half your body weight in ounces of water. If you're well hydrated, it's gonna help the digestive process. You also wanna make sure that you're staying active throughout the day. If you live a sedentary lifestyle where you're not moving around very much, that's gonna cause things to get stuck in your digestive digestive track, you really need to be moving around and at least going out for a walk or doing something active to help your body utilize the processes that it does pretty effortlessly on its own. You just need to give it a kickstart sometimes. And then for help with sensory overwhelm, you want to make sure that you're reducing sensory input as much as possible around bedtime. I think his purring is getting picked up on the microphone. He's been sick this week. He had a bladder infection and he had to get an x-ray. Oh, there you go. I know. Okay, so to help with sensory overwhelm, you're going to want to reduce sensory input as much as possible around bedtime or even a little bit before. Like after dinner, set a rule for yourself or your family, no screen time, or we're going to go out for a walk. Um, We're going to go be out in nature for a little bit. We're going to do, I'm going to do some stretching or some yoga. Yoga is an awesome way to wind down at the end of the night. And there's a channel called Yoga with Adrienne. She even has practices that are specifically for like bedtime 
bedtime yoga with Adrienne, you can check it out. Those types of practices will really help sensory overwhelm and can actually help you with delayed processing because if you connect with your body, this is a secret that I'm learning, if you connect with your body, that can help you process the events of the day. Life hack. Also, this might seem a little bit weird and I'm like bending down now so I can snuggle my cat. Um, this might seem a little bit weird, but move gently and slowly at night. So sometimes I'll notice myself just like hustling and bustling around like, oh, I gotta get the backpacks, I gotta get the lunch boxes, I gotta get blah, blah, blah. And I just notice that I have this kind of chaotic energy at night sometimes where I'm just like going all over the house. Um, but moving mindfully with intention, I know some of you are like, oh, but try it. Like, okay, I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna go get myself a glass of water and I'm gonna just be gentle with the way that I move. Uh, it really can change a lot. So don't hate on it until you try it. And then also to help with delayed processing, you might wanna try journaling at night. That would actually be a really good wind down activity. You could do that in bed and that's not screen related. Uh, also try communicating intentionally with your partner or a friend. It doesn't have to be in person. You know, at night that could be a good way to wind down and also could help with delayed processing if you talk through the events of the day with someone and not just like, you know, I know being in an established relationship, it's easy to kind of forget that intentionality, but just connecting with each other and saying, Hey, how was your day? And like, what were, what were the tough parts? What was really exciting? Um, I think it's always good to have a reminder to come back to those little practices. The bottom line for all of these remedies and tools is self-awareness. So I think I mentioned it earlier, but just having this self-awareness that you have these challenges and that these are your tendencies and these are your patterns, you have to be aware of something first before it can change. And just having that information can be very helpful. Sometimes you don't even have to do anything with it. Just the awareness can kind of start subconsciously, you start making little shifts to accommodate that. Also give yourself grace and compassion. We do things differently and that's okay. We've seen it modeled differently our whole lives and have probably tried to make ourselves fit in a box of how other people do their sleep routine and how other people get sleep at night. Um, and that might not work for us. So give yourself grace, compassion, you do things differently, that's okay. And then with the self-awareness, you can start taking baby steps toward change. It doesn't have to be this big overarching overhaul of your life, just baby steps. And usually lasting change, I've found it's a gradual process. It's a long-term pro process that you have to keep revisiting and updating as you grow. Okay, so my favorite part of the video that I've been looking forward to, my favorite thing that I sleep with every single night, drum roll please, my Manta mask. It is the coolest thing. It is so comfortable. I can't see you, so I'm gonna take it off. This is unlike any sleep mask that I have worn before. And that's true. Like I will not share things with y'all, products with y'all, unless I truly love them. So this material right here, these are called, I think like total blackout cups. It's true. Like it's legit. It's total blackout. This feels like this material, the comfiest t-shirt that you've had, you know, from college that you've worn, washed like 25,000 times and it's barely hanging on. Like this is that soft, wonderful t-shirt texture. And what's so cool about these products, this actually isn't my favorite thing. I'm about to show you my favorite, favorite thing. Their products are interchangeable. So you can take off these eye cups. I'm gonna do it away from the microphone. Okay, here's the eye cups. And you can put them on their other products. So this is actually my favorite, favorite sleep product. This is the weighted sleep mask. And it is just as good as it sounds. So you can take the eye cups and put them on the inside here. These little tabs say your nose. <laughs> this is where your nose should go. Okay, and then the weighted sleep mask. Oh my gosh. I mean, just right now, I, I, I'm sleepy. It feels so good. There's these beads inside weighted beads. The material again on this is so, so soft. I wear it every single night. It's very calming. I also have max eye cups and these max eye cups are just a little bit bigger if you need more space, but they're, oh, I forgot to say one of the reasons they are so cool. There's room to blink. 
So, you know, like if I wear other eye masks, I blink and I can feel it. You can't feel it if you blink on these eye masks. Like that's part of how they designed it is there's room to blink. Isn't that so cool? That sounds like an autistic thing. Like we have to make sure there's room to blink. Okay, so it's a, it's sensory friendly. And also there's versions that I don't have yet that I really want. The reason I'm telling you this is because I have a discount code that you can use and I'll put it in the description. They have other cups. Uh, they have a cool mask that is really good for help with migraines and allergies. So they're like blue cups that I believe you can put in the refrigerator or the freezer. And then you put them on, oh my gosh, I wish I had it right now. And then they also have a steam cup, which you can I believe put in the microwave and then it's really good for soothing your sinuses and dry eyes and then their newest product i really am a fan y'all this isn't like oh buy this stuff this is like i love this stuff uh their newest mask the way they advertise it is the most comfortable bluetooth sleep mask in existence that's like tm i think <laughs> um so it's it's similar to what I've shown you, but it has Bluetooth headphones in it. So some of you had said in the comments that that's really helpful to you in managing your sleep challenges is having the Bluetooth sound uh, speakers. So at night you can listen to white noise or brown noise is all the rage. Um, so anyways, they have a lot of different versions. This weighted sleep mask is my favorite by far, so far, because I want to try all of their things. They also have a glow in the dark mask. Okay, I'm done talking about it. But if you'll please, if you're interested, use the link in the description because um, some of the proceeds go back to support the channel. And then also you'll get 10% off your order. So the code to use is mom on the spectrum. You can put that in at checkout when you visit the link in the description for the Manta sleep mask. I know you'll love it. It's so, so great. And again, I wouldn't share anything with you if I didn't absolutely love it and use it all the time. So if you're looking for a community where you can kind of process some of the ideas that we talked about today, if you need to talk with somebody who just gets it, I'm running community groups for the autistic community and you can check those out at momonthespectrum.life slash community. They are groups that meet through Google Meet. We can interact through video chat or microphone only if that's more comfortable for you or text chat only. And each group is focused on a different topic. So autistic inertia and demand avoidance is coming up. Autistic masking, I've got a session coming up on that. We also have parent support groups, neurodiverse relationship support groups. So you can find all of that out and more momonthespectrum.life slash community. I will also put that link in the description. Thanks so much for watching. I love what I do. I really appreciate that you are spending your time here with me. I know there's so many other things that you could be doing. Hopefully the channel brings you a feeling of self-compassion and grace and just the feeling that you're okay and that you're an asset to this world. You are a beautiful person. There is nothing wrong with you. Can't wait to see you in the next video. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already so you can stay up to date with all of the resources that we have here for the adult autistic community. And I will see you in the next video. Bye.